Hi, I'm Ken Burns. I'm thrilled to welcome you to this local event for our newest film, Muhammad Ali. Storytelling is at the heart of public media, and this story brings to life one of the best known and indelible figures of the 20th century, a man who insisted on being himself unconditionally, becoming an inspiration to people everywhere. We appreciate the support of your local public television station, which makes it possible for us to tell complicated and in-depth stories like this one. Thank you for being here today. Hello, and welcome to KCTS9's discussion on athletes and activism in celebration of the new Ken Burns documentary, Muhammad Ali. My name is Art Teal, longtime Seattle sports columnist, now at Sports Press Northwest and formerly of the Seattle Post Intelligencer. I contribute weekly podcasts to NPR affiliate KNKX FM 88.5. I would like to acknowledge that we all live, work, and play on the traditional territories of indigenous peoples and that we occupy this land. To be a part of the effort to move forward toward equitable relationships and reconciliation, I encourage you to learn about the past and present of the land where you live and its people. Then think about your relationship to the land and what you can do to honor and actively care for it. A few links in the chat will help. If you haven't seen it yet, the four part, eight hour documentary, Muhammad Ali, directed by Ken Burns and written and co-directed by Sarah Burns and David McMahon, is available for on-demand streaming at kcts9.org. I thought I knew the Ali narrative. I learned a lot. This is fabulous filmmaking. There's a direct link in the chat. Tonight we'll be discussing the legacy that Ali created and how that translates to today. I'll be speaking with several experts over the course of the next few segments during tonight's segment. At the end, we'll have an audience Q&A with our full group of speakers. So please submit your questions in the chat, which is on the right-hand side of your screen. Please also use the chat to engage in the conversation by sharing your thoughts and feedback throughout the event. Ali's activism is a controversial subject, so please remember to abide by the event code of conduct while participating in the, dis in the discussion. Let's go ahead and get the conversation going in the chat. What is the first thing that comes to mind when you think of Muhammad Ali? Before we welcome our first speakers, let's watch a clip from the documentary. This is when Ali is found guilty of refusing the Vietnam War draft. Two weeks later, an all-white Houston jury found Ali guilty of refusing the draft. The judge, ignoring the more lenient recommendation of the prosecutor, sentenced him to the maximum, five years in prison and a $10,000 fine. And he would have to surrender his passport. Ali's lawyers immediately filed an appeal, prepared to go all the way to the Supreme Court if necessary a process that could take years. Ali remained free, but without his title or a license to box. He fully expected that he would one day go to jail for his beliefs. We who are followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the religion of Islam, we believe in obeying the laws of the land. We are taught to obey the laws of the land as long as it don't conflict with our religious beliefs. Will you go into service as such? This would be a thousand percent against the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the religion of Islam, and the Holy Quran, the holy book that we believe in. This will all be denouncing and defying everything that I stand for. This would mean, of course, that you stand the chance of going to jail as a result of not going into service. You well, whatever the punishment, whatever the persecution is for standing up for my religious beliefs, even if it means facing machine gun fire that day, I will face it before denouncing Elijah Muhammad and the religion of Islam. I'm ready to die. When I think about him saying, if they want to put me before a firing squad tomorrow, I'm ready to die before I abandon my religion. Um, that's it. You can't teach that kind of thing in lectures, in books. That kind of thing has to be modeled. 
and models turn into traditions. And traditions provide people with the mechanical memory to do the right thing. That's what Muhammad Ali represented in that moment. I mean, anybody now faced with a major decision in which the right way is clear and the wrong way is clear, but the consequences are dire, now they have a model that they can fall back on psychologically, emotionally, spiritually. That's what Muhammad Ali represented in that moment. And that, to me, that moment will live on forever. Now I'd like to introduce Imran Zalik, who is Executive Director of the Council on American Islamic Relations for Washington. He's an advocate and a prominent voice for justice in the American Muslim community. Mike Bethea is the well-respected head basketball coach at Seattle's Rainier Beach High School. He's known for player development and instilling high character in his players on and off the court. He is guided by faith in all he does. Thank you for both being here this evening. Imran, let's start with you. Well into his decline from Parkinson's disease, Ali continued to use his platform after 9-11 to counter anti-Muslim bigotry. How does that parallel your organization's work and how relevant is Ali to that work today? Yeah, I mean, he's somebody who's, you know, seminal to the American Muslim community in this country. Uh, black Muslims in America, we owe a lot to the black Muslim community of this country as they've laid the foundation for Islam in America. So before Islamophobia was even a word, black Muslims were bearing the brunt of suspicion, surveillance and authorization. And so even during that time frame when he was, you know, in the uh, post 9-11 era, he was there f as as a spokesperson for the Muslim community standing up uh, for what he believed in. And even even though his speech skills and his motor skills diminished, he still represented that kindness and humanity of Islam and Muslims for the entire world for his, his very last day. So that really informed the activism of people like myself, um, who, as somebody who grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, um, in 1996, when he was there uh, lighting the Olympic flame, like that was a really pivotal moment in my life, like that as a Muslim American right there on the biggest stage in the world lighting that flame, that just is something that we stand on his shoulders as activists to try and carry his message forward. I was there for that moment as well. It was one of the seminal experiences of my sports writing career to have Ali walk out and uh, hear his name chanted. It shook the building. Imran, 25% uh, of the Muslim community is black. For a generation that is growing up after his boxing career and after his passing, how meaningful is his history, particularly his outspokenness about his faith? It's extremely important, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I think there's so many misconceptions about what Islam is, what Islam in America is. Uh, as you said, up to a quarter of the community is, is Black American, so we must never forget that. But if you really look at the stand that he made, look back at the time frame, and then fast forward to the time frame that we are in today, because 1964 when he was making the stand, there was uh, three TV channels in America. There was maybe the radio industry and then there was the newspaper industry. And that was how public opinion was basically being formed at that time. We didn't live in the age of the internet and cable news and like varying opinions are out there. So these media outlets were really perpetuating systemic racism. So his bravery is just magnified many times full just by the stands that he was able to make. If you fast forward another 30 years to when Mahmoud Abdul Rauf refused to stand for the national anthem, you know, citing his beliefs, the country was still not ready for that type of uh, response yet. And you saw that by the backlash and him being blackballed from the NBA because of that. And so even uh, as recently as, as Colin Kaepernick taking a knee because he was standing up for um, against police brutality um, and you know, because of what he said, we saw all these visceral things happening, whether it's Trayvon Martin, whether it was um, Mike, Michael Brown and so many countless others that were actually caught on film. And yet Colin Kaepernick hasn't played it down in the NFL in five years. And this is during the Internet age. So it just speaks to him being a pioneer in this. And that really um, is something that we should hold on to and you know, teach future generations about just the boldness of how Ali stood up. 
In regards to faith and sports, you have a story about the Abdullah brothers, uh, Hussein and uh, Hamza, the latter who played for Washington State uh, in uh, in 2004, in the early 2000s. Um, he, both of them prioritized a pil pilgrimage to Mecca over playing in a football season. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I mean, as, as many of us who are sports fans know, the life of a profession, professional athlete from the time you're a child, and you know, Mike knows this as well as somebody who's, who's involved in athletics, like from the time you're a child, getting up through high school, college, and, and making it to the NFL, like every single day of your life is uh, to make it to that next level. So somebody making it to the NFL, let alone two brothers making it to the NFL after this lifetime of, of dedication to um, their craft, is extremely difficult. They're in the top 0.1% of, of the people who actually do that job for a living. So choosing to make that uh, trip to Mecca for a Hajj, um, they were both getting towards the tail ends of their careers. And it's hard to make an NFL roster. It's very difficult year by year. You have to show up there. You're competing with younger players who are competing your, for your position. So they have to make the calculated risk. Do I honor this article of faith in my in my religion and complete something that I know in my life and, you know, for my afterlife and in, in Islam, like that I need to complete this, this tenet of my faith, or should I just put it off another year, a few years and, and not go. So they really prioritize their belief system. Um, you know, for Hamza who lives here in the Seattle area, like that, that's a really big, big move that he made. And that was basically like, you know, the tail end of his, his career, Hussein had to come back and then he had to, battle for a roster spot to even get back to the nfl and he did that he you know performed at a very high, high level so it just speaks to how modern day athletes in our in our communities here are still like you know using faith and action to to inform how they how they uh you know move forward thanks Imran. let's turn to mike I, mike you you coach in, in an extremely diverse world including diversity in faith how do you manage the coexistence and the tolerance among the athletes you think? Well, you know, it, it, it first starts with respect. You know, I'm a firm believer in uh, knowing what you believe, knowing why you believe it, and then standing for it. And, uh, you know, down at Rainier Beach High School, we're a coach. Uh, you know, I have, like you said, from, from, from religions, uh, from all over, uh, you know, I, I have some young men who last year took the year off. Uh, you know, some Muslim kids, uh, and you know that was that was their strong belief, and I respected that. And it wasn't, you know, uh, because of my beliefs and my religion. Uh, you know, I uh, I understood where they were coming from, and I supported it. You know, it, it wasn't one of those things about trying to make them make a choice. Uh, it was about uh, respecting their decision and then standing standing for them and giving them the strength they need uh, to stand behind their decision. Uh, you know, I, I'm actually 64 years old and I remember uh, at a young age, all the stuff that Muhammad Ali stood for. Um, you know, I, I still remember sitting in front of the uh, radio uh, and <laughs> listening to the fight between him and Sonny Liston. And, uh, you know, having my, my father who was uh, from the South, uh, try to explain to me, uh, you know, the importance of standing, you know, knowing what you believe, knowing why you believe it, and then standing firm in it, uh, and, and knowing that some of the things you're going to face, some of the adversities you're going to face. Um, and, you know, I, I think what Muhammad Ali did was, was open the door for everything that's going on now. He was at the, you know, that was at the height of the black power movement. And unfortunately what happens in those situations is they lump everything into kind of like a melting pot. So whether you're violent, nonviolent, you're going to be lumped in into that melting pot, just like, like what's going on today uh, because people are not, uh, what they're not doing is, is doing a what I believe is a clear job of explaining what it is they're standing for. Uh, you know, when you look at the, the Black Lives Matter movement right now, it's all lumped in with Antifa and all, you know, the, the violent and nonviolent groups. And this here is the perception that everybody has. Uh, and, and one thing that Muhammad Ali did is he made it clear what it was that he stood for, period. And, um, 
you know, it, it opened the door for the John Carloses and the Tommy Smiths. I know I'm dating myself, but John Carlos and Tommy Smith, uh, they took a stand for black power at the 1968 Olympics, which also led to a black boycott. Uh, and you can help me with this. Uh, our, our, uh, yeah, I think it was the 1968 Olympics uh, yeah. Yeah. when the blacks uh, all boycotted uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, uh, Charlie Scott, all the blacks boycotted the Olympics. And uh, what what it basically did, like like I said, is it it um it it, it paved the way for what we're going through now. And uh, you know, you just you 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 have to look back on the impact he really had on not just boxing and sports and stuff, but the the impact that he had on on uh, uh, the strides that we've made. As as black athletes, as minority athletes, and uh, and you know the one thing, and Imran, you can help me with this. And if I'm not mistaken, Muhammad Ali, he actually he instead of the Nation of Islam, he actually once he once he uh, uh, he kind of denounced that and he embraced Sunni Islam. Him and Malcolm X both did. Which basically, uh, I, and like I said, um, I know that it embraced integration amongst the Muslims instead of just being black Muslims, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, you know, it, like I said, what it basically did is it paved the way for us to have, you know, to have a voice today in athletics. And it all go, ties back to Muhammad Ali. Um, Mike, I'd like to. I'd like to ask you um, another question about the 60s because you had an emotional investment. You lost a brother in the Vietnam War. I did. I had a uh, brother, uh, my brother Troy, uh, in, in 1968 at uh, 18 years old, 17 years old, just out of high school, uh, he was drafted. Uh, he did one term in, the, uh, uh, in Vietnam. He came back and it was an incident that happened back in Seattle at the time that made him actually sign up for another tour of Vietnam. He was actually driving through the central area and he was pulled over and uh, they maced him and they, you know, they took him out, they handcuffed him. And this is a, a guy who was fighting for his country. And uh, it was during the time right after Martin Luther King was shot uh, and Seattle was kind of, Seattle itself was just kind of like uh, exploding uh, from a racial standpoint, the Black Panthers, the Black Panther movement was going on. And so my brother came, when he came back, he basically said, you know, rather than uh, fight, and they gave him a choice. They told him he could do riot duty because, you know, America was exploding. They said, you can do riot duty or you can go back to Vietnam. And he told us, he said, you know, uh, I would rather go to Vietnam and die fighting for my country and fighting against my black brothers in the streets, you know, trying to stand up for racial justice. Well, that brings up a question. How do you reconcile his sacrifice with Ali's conscientious objector status in seeking a deferment based on religion? Well, you know, again, that's that's about or that's about respecting others' uh, choices. Uh, you respect the fact that this is what Muhammad Ali believed in. And, uh, you know, you don't hold that against him. You know, my brother looked up to Muhammad Ali. Uh, he felt that Muhammad Ali uh, paved the way for even a person like him to make a decision like he made. Uh, his decision was to go to Vietnam and fight for his country instead of staying in this country and uh, fight against racial injustice. I mean, or, or fight for racial injustice. Uh, so it's uh it's one of those things where you know uh i really you know just 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 because of that experience uh again that doesn't change my opinion uh of of the stand that muhammad ali took uh for right. not just for his for for for, for his uh, religion but for people in the general thanks to both of you we're going to see you again in a bit in the documentary we learned that 12-year-old Cassius Clay's new red bicycle was stolen. In tears, Clay found a policeman to report the crime and said 
he wanted to whoop the thief who stole his bike. Serendipitously, the policeman was Sergeant Joe Martin in Louisville, who trained boxers. He encouraged Clay to return to the gym and learn how to box before looking for retaliation. It was a pivotal moment that launched his career. Do you have a red bike moment, a transformational event in your life that came from encountering adversity? The Muhammad Ali Center is partnering, is partnering with PBS stations to collect red bike moment stories. Details on how to share yours are in the chat. Now let's check out this fun Ali themed boxing workout video from one of the community partners for this event. Hi, my name is Coach Mike. This is my boxer, Dion. We're gonna do a little boxing demo today in honor of the new Muhammad Ali documentary on KCTS Channel 9. Muhammad Ali was known for his energy, his charisma, and of course his mouth. But his conditioning was incredible. We still use drills that he did from footwork in the ring to handling the leverage of a sledgehammer to flipping tires. And of course, jumping rope. His ab workouts were amazing. Makes me hurt just thinking about him. Then his agility on the speed bag to working mitts. Muhammad Ali is a true champion. Cappy's has been around the Seattle Central District for over 20 years. We offer a warm and welcoming safe place for anyone and everyone to learn how to box and get fit. We use some of the old school style workout drills that made famous by Muhammad Ali. If you'd like to come in and take some fitness classes or do some one-on-one -on -one training, feel free to check out our website at cappiesgym.com. Cappies has donated a membership and some boxing gear for a lucky member of tonight's audience. If you opted in for the drawing when you reserved your ticket for tonight's event, be sure to check your email and phone messages tomorrow. Now we have two short clips from the documentary. In the first, Ali reacts to the U.S. Supreme Court reversing his conviction for draft evasion. The second addresses Ali's evolution beyond boxing. The court unanimously threw out the conviction of boxer Muhammad Ali or Cassius Clay. On June 28, 1971, as Ali was leaving a corner store on the south side of Chicago, the shopkeeper heard the news and ran after him to let him know. Oh, I was on 78th Street on the south side and just bought me orange in the grocery store and the grocery owner came out and grabbed me and hugged me with tears in his eyes, a little black fella, and told me that you've just been vindicated and you free, eight judges all voted in your favor. And he just hugged me and squeezed me. And... How do you feel about our system now? Well, I don't know who will be assassinated tonight. I don't know who will be enslaved or mistreated. I don't know who will be deprived of some other justice or equality. So I can't say nothing. All I can talk about is my case. And I'm thankful that the courts recognized my sincerity and my beliefs in this case. It was so beautiful. Oh, that was beautiful. I cried because it was, I was so happy. My brother, my brother faced a prison, prison sentence. He was found guilty. He wasn't found guilty. They let him go. He was right. The Supreme Court said he's right. It's just so beautiful. It showed show there's a God. It was easy for me. It was easy. You know why? What he's doing in his mind was doing the right thing. Do the right thing in life, you're happy. Go remember what people say. Do what you think is right. Somebody asked me once in, in high school, what do you think about the war in Vietnam and maybe going over there and fighting? And I said, listen, 
I can't see any reason I'd be shooting these Vietnamese men and women. Why would I be doing that? Why would I go there? Why would I support that? Uh, I thought it was my own thought. That shows how powerful Muhammad Ali is. It was a thought that I had gotten from him, but I didn't even know I got it from him. When he says, no Viet Cong ever called me, I mean, somehow that got into my head, but I, not, on, not on purpose, not consciously. And that's a real leader. He influences you, and you don't know what's happening. Ali, late in life, talked about this tallying angel, he called it, that there was an angel up there who counted all the good things you did in life and all the bad things you did in life. And if you had more bad things than good things, you were going to hell. And he had a very vivid impression of what hell meant. And he acknowledged that he had a lot of negative marks, that the tallying angel was not going to be uh, happy with the way he had treated women in particular. 30 years after Ali first faced Joe Frazier, a reporter asked him about their long-running feud. I called him a lot of names that I shouldn't have called him, Ali admitted. I apologize for that. I like Joe Frazier. Me and him was a good show. Frazier never forgave Ali. Later, he expressed sorrow at having abandoned Malcolm X. Turning my back on Malcolm was one of the mistakes that I regret most in my life, he wrote. I wished I'd been able to tell Malcolm I was sorry that he was right about so many things. Daddy evolved, he became better. And Daddy said that I'm bigger than boxing. That meant boxing was this much His evolution into the person he is today is way bigger than him just boxing. And I think he knew that. And he carried it with him. His love. And he gave it to every single person he met. And I think that's beautiful. As the 20th century came to an end, Newsweek, Time, and Sports Illustrated all named him Athlete of the Century. In the days after the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, American Muslims were the victims of hate crimes simply because of their faith. I am a Muslim. I am an American, Ali responded. If the culprits are Muslim, they have twisted the teachings of Islam. Whoever performed the terrorist attacks does not represent Islam. God is not behind assassins. What I hope is that Muhammad Ali will be a constant reminder uh, uh, to America of just how thoroughly American a believing, practicing, sincerely committed Muslim can be. Whatever one's background is, Ali belongs to America, all of us. And I think that he belongs to all of us because he affected all of us. And I hope that that's part of the legacy that he will leave, that America won't forget Ali as this American Muslim with, with equal emphasis on American Muslim. On November 9, 2005, President George W. Bush presented Ali with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor in the United States. That same year, the Muhammad Ali Center, a museum dedicated to his life and legacy, opened in Louisville. Muhammad Ali was an activist who fought to reach us a certain way and to move America in a certain way, to move individuals in a certain way. I'm going to take this path. I believe that I'm right. And even if I'm not right, I'm still me. And to be able to follow that and to know that there was going to be an enormous price to pay for that and to have that be generational, to have that live on beyond you is extremely valuable. 
everything that he did couldn't be undone. To discuss what we just saw and discuss the role of contemporary athletes in activism, I'd like to welcome Suzanne Potts and Joshua Ford. Suzanne is with Athletes for Hope, a national organization founded by Ali and several other prominent athletes. Joshua is a retired soccer player and currently an assistant coach with Sounders FC and Tacoma Defiance and a co-founder of the Seattle-based Athletic Justice Collective. Welcome to both of you. Susan, let's start with you. Uh, what is Athletes for Hope? Thank you, Art. Athletes for Hope is a nonprofit organization that was founded 15 years ago by Muhammad Ali, Mia Hamm, Andre Agassi, Jackie Joyner Kersey, um, Warwick Dunn. We have uh, 12 or 13 founders that really took to heart this idea of being a champion outside of your sport for a cause that you're passionate about. So be it so social justice or cancer or animal activism, um, they really wanted to educate other athletes about connecting to causes you're passionate about. So we were born out of that dream and um, we help educate athletes about sports philanthropy. We connect them to causes and communities every day and we recognize athletes doing good. We know there's thousands of examples every day of athletes doing great things and that's part of our platform is to share this. Why is activism among athletes so important? We think it's so important because we see athletes every day using their platform for good and that they have a unique voice as a role model in communities. It's not just about playing their sport. It's about stepping outside of themselves and doing um, good things for others. So they are uniquely positioned um, both in their sport and, and the communities to help uplift and motivate others to do the same. So uh, when an athlete has the opportunity to get material things like a college scholarship or a pro career, activism can put him or her at risk. What do you say to an athlete who wants to be an activist and about the risks and the rewards? And do you cite the LE story? We do. We often utilize his example to others when we're talking about athlete activism. And we know there's a risk of losing you know, scholarships or sponsorships. If you're a student athlete, um, if you're a pro athlete, there's, you know, sponsors and, and people out there that are supporting and funding you who may not like your cause. And that's a risk. But that personal risk that I think was mentioned in the film about doing good for others, I think greatly outweighs the, the possible loss of a funder. We've also seen and other people step up perhaps in support of you. So we know that no major movement has ever happened alone, right? Be it one person or many people lifting up their voices to advocate for others. And so um, I think our argument is always it's worth the risk to step into that space and use your platform for good. And do you find that there is a difficulty sometimes with parents who want to make sure that their kids don't do something that might jeopardize their future? I think we definitely see as athletes mature and get older, um, just like with Muhammad Ali, and he kind of stepped into his own comfort level with being an advocate. We definitely see that influence roll away as athletes mature and perhaps um, find things that they're passionate about. It's deeply personal. It's not something that comes easily to people. It's also not something that just, you know, you have to kind of practice at it. So that's one of the things we do at Athletes for Hope is help athletes discover their passions connect to causes and maybe try it out and, and connect to those nonprofits or charities and then really use their platforms for good if they're comfortable with it. So parents can be an influence, coaches, teammates, um, community members, faith leaders, they all play a major influence in building that athlete confidence and stepping into their cause. Well, let's turn to Joshua. Uh, can you explain the focus of at the Athletic Justice Collective? What do you seek to change? Yes, so uh, first, our whole point was to go ahead and bring people together that are like-minded as the co-founder, along with myself, Sean Muldoon. Um, and we first got started, like we both worked with inside the Sounders organization, but both had conversations about when Colin Kaepernick was kneeling in 2016, and obviously within the pandemic last year, uh, with George Floyd being murdered and everything of that nature, um, we thought it was important to be able to bring things to a local level, right? And we mean that by 
many people may not know, but Manuel Ellis was murdered in March 3rd, 2020, right? And that was just a few days, a few days after, um, a little bit of time after George Floyd. And so for us, we thought it was important that people look at home first, instead of always looking at national news and, and getting more aware of things that are going on in the local community. And so for us with the Athletic Justice Collective was being able to kind of be able to talk to either people within certain organizations that are professional athletes, people that are in professional environments, and having a safe space to be able to communicate and, and take action, right? And one thing about that was to be able to create space for someone to now, how do I take action? What do I feel like I need to take action about? And ways that we can communicate that and have teach-ins and ways to promote activism, right? For people that may just be starting or people that have just unsure of how to be able to voice their opinion or voice their um, themselves. And for us, that was key to be able to provide that space and provide that luxury of talking with someone that you may not know or cross paths because you don't work in the same organization, but they're having maybe the same struggles. They're having the same issues that, that you see in your environment. And so for us, it was important to be able to connect all as one and, and figure ways that we can contribute to our local community. Uh, police behavior is being scrutinized as never before um, in this country, and it's become a cultural flashpoint, and young people are often trapped in the middle. What do you say to young athletes who are dealing with this crisis and trying to be athletes, tr trying to lead, yet authority figures are resenting some of their actions? Well, for me, I think that was a reason on why I've stayed inside of uh, the Sounders organization for a while was so that people that look like me are able to have someone to communicate with, someone that understands the issues that they may be going through, something that may happen on the field, something that may happen in their own personal life. And for me, I felt that was important to be around, to be able to have a sounding board of someone that, you know, in the soccer environment, there isn't a lot of diversity in the coaching staff at some points. So for me, I felt it was a critical point in my career when I retired to be able to stay within soccer and be able to at least be be there for someone that may look like me or may look similar to me and having that advocate for them saying like it's okay to be able to communicate or express yourself um, for the police part I feel like it's very important that you know yes police officers are there to potentially help and protect but there's also parts where we get scrutinized for what we look like and that's a huge issue and for me, I think it's important that we're able to, one, be there for the youth, right? There's organizations that are out there that are looking to help mentor people. One is MUST, right? It's mentoring urban students and teens, which is in Washington itself, and it's ran by Kelvin Washington and a great bunch of other people, right, that are looking to help mentor young students to be able to help themselves find confidence, find their ability to be able to express themselves, go down the street, and not feel like they're a threat. And also being able to now create opportunities to advance themselves, right? Promoting the ability to graduate high school and promoting chances to go to college and promoting chances to now communicate with people that are in upper echelon type of positions, CEOs to CFOs to people like that, to be able to create an opportunity to further their advancement in their life. And for a black male in America, that's something that's critical and needed to be happening long before uh, I was born. Obviously, a lot of attention goes to the dramatic episodes in our pro sports culture, like uh, kneel downs at in stadiums um, during anthems. But where do you think athletes behind the scenes can have the greatest impact away from the spotlight and the headlines? I think that's important. You know, I think it's, uh, as Suzanne put out, it's important for athletes to use their platforms, right? But not all platforms have to be vocal, right? I think there's multiple people that I've had conversations with that use their platforms in ways that don't always have to be notarized by the community or by, uh, by TV or them posting something. It's more so about making a change in the community that you want to see, right? I can't be mad in 30 years if I don't make a change or take a stance on something because what did I do to affect it? How did I make a change? And I think that's important for not just athletes, but people as human beings to be able to take that take that step. And for athletes themselves, right, it's being able to take that risk, being comfortable about who you are and what you stand for and 
you know, that was a big thing about Muhammad Ali. He knew what he stood for, and, and that's exactly what, you know, everyone aspires to be, is to be true to who they are and being able to voice what they, what they feel. Well, thanks to you both. We're going to bring you back in just a few minutes for the group Q&A. Did you have a poster, a photo, or some other kind of artwork hanging from your bedroom wall of an athlete you idolized as a kid? Perhaps you have an artistic piece of sports memorabilia now. Take a moment to share in the chat. Let's see what adorns the walls of our audience members. Art is a way humans have immortalized iconic athletes. KCTS9 worked with the Shack Art Center in Everett on a student art initiative around Ali's six core principles. Students attending a free Zoom workshop with art instructors received a discussion of the principles, which are confidence, conviction, dedication, respect, giving, and spirituality. They were asked to express them in original artwork. You can check out some of the pieces and descriptions that accompany them in the virtual gallery below. The artwork is also on display at Shack through November 6th. Local artist Keenan Hall has collaborated with KCTS9 to create a piece of art in honor of Ali. Keegan recreates iconic photos of athletes, including Seahawks quarterback Russell Wilson and other well-known figures in needlepoint graphite. That's right, a pencil. And now he's added charcoal, a task that takes hundreds of hours. The Ali photo Keegan used as a reference for this project was taken by Jeff Julian, a photographer who spent much of his career photographing Ali at his Deer Park, Pennsylvania training facility. Take a look at the process of creating this piece of art. A limited number of signed prints are available for purchase through the link provided in the chat. The original artwork is also for sale. Proceeds from the sales of the print will be donated to local organizations doing work that aligns with Ali's legacy of civic engagement. CAR Washington and the, and the local Boys and Girls Clubs of America. Okay, well now we're gonna bring back all of our speakers for audience Q&A. If you have a question, please share it in the chat if you haven't already, and we'll get to as many as we can. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. First question, um, do you feel that the media played any role in the negative perception of Cassius Clay during his earlier years in the ring? I suppose I should answer that one. Um, I've been a part of it, but I, I'll, everyone can chip in. Um, yes, I think it was a big, factor because there was, I believe it was, um, uh, we talked a little bit earlier about the 60s and the culture of the time media wise was three television uh, network stations, a daily newspaper, radio, and that was about it. Pre-internet, pre-social media, pre-smartphone. And one or two voices could carry the day in a media firestorm. And that was often the case with some of the uh, top reporters and columnists in print, in New York Times, Washington Post. And uh, I think a lot of, of the criticism was Ali breaking from norms. It may not have been religion. It may have, it certainly was part of it, it was certainly race, but he upset many people with his brashness, with his command, and with his sincerity 
advocating what seemed to be, to white America at that time, uh, a very controversial position and a very uh, bombastic personality. There were, and the media was a big part of that. And anyone else care to chip in? Yeah, I mean, I'll just add uh, this something that I mentioned earlier in the, in the program as well. Is, I mean, we're still dealing with forms of media bias today in 2021 with the work that, that CARE Washington does. So it's it's still a challenge in, uh, you know, 50, 57 years after uh, he initially uh, were, was making the statements. Um, and yeah, it's, it's tough because in, in the situation, just a handful of people uh, just based off of the headline or the lead that you're putting out there, you're shaping public perceptions about whether it's the civil rights movement or people's religious views on the war or just the religion of Islam as a whole. So it's it's definitely something that, but it's amazing. It's you know something that's pretty miraculous as well in terms of at that point in time, he was ostensibly the most hated man in America um, just because of that public opinion that was put out there. But if you fast forward to you know the late 80s you know up to 90s until the time he died he was possibly the most beloved man on the face of the earth so it's just amazing how he made that uh made that shift over time another question um how do you uh reconcile the contempt that a lot of white people had for ali in the 60s and the 70s um now his legacy is hailed by many. Is that uh, hypocritical, a conflict? Josh, you want to try that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's both things that uh, our mom and I have both talked about with you know, Colin Kaepernick. He faced the same things in 2016 to where now in 2020, right in 2021, that people are trying and starting to change their narrative about what he was doing in the first place, right? Where he was first being told that he was he was kneeling and that was disrespecting the flag, where he came out and clearly voiced that I am kneeling for social injustice and police brutality to black and brown people. Mm -hmm. But no one wanted to hear that. They wanted to hear the narrative that was being spoken and, and things that were being talked about as, oh, he's disrespecting the flag in the country while he was trying to promote awareness of things that are going on in, in my community. We know the personal stance that Ali took on the Vietnam War, but um, what overall impact do you think his, his decision had on the anti-war movement? And Mike, you were around for that time. Can you answer that? Uh, you, you know, it, the, the thing that um, was put out there, uh, uh, the focus was on uh, on Muhammad Ali. Uh, and to a lesser was, at that time, was also the hippie movement, who they basically, you know, they uh, they protested the war in their, their, in their own way. But uh, again, the focus was on Muhammad Ali and you know, a lot of it was, and you talked about it earlier, in the 60s and 70s, uh, you had the the old school racist way of thinking of the boy needs to stay in his place. He doesn't know his place. And so this was their way of trying to put him in his place. And he, and, and, and of course, as we know, Ali was, you know, you can't define what my place is. You can't define what my belief is. And he stood for that. He sent the message that it was okay to to stand for that. And um, you know, they uh, of course, with just three media stations, uh, of course, they controlled what they thought of him. They they you know we didn't get to vote until 1964, the same the same year. So you know you had all of that stuff tying in together, and it basically um, <laughs> their, their way of keeping us down. He was a voice for for freedom that they were trying to silence. Uh, Susanna, a question uh, for you, just a kind of a simple personality um, analysis. What makes Muhammad Ali such a compelling figure? Well, I think some of the other speakers talked about this and clearly the video showcases it. He was bold, he was audacious. He had a vision for who he wanted to be, both in his sport, in his faith, in his personal life 
And I love the fact that his daughter spoke about how he evolved over time. Like we all hope to evolve. And we know there's a lot of work that still needs to happen in communities. And um, I think that speaks to this generation. I think it inspires hope and motivates others. Um, and we are seeing it every single day with the athletes that we work with from the WNBA to um, the NWSL, you know, men's basketball, football, people are inspired to stand up and be bold. And um, I think that carried through from his personality. Uh, Imran, perhaps for you, um, the role of the athlete in contemporary sports has sort of evolved. Um, it's a much more corporate experience. It wasn't nearly as corporate as uh, we saw it in the 60s with Ali. What do you tell athletes about how to define their activism in light of the overwhelming authority and power of the corporations? Yeah, and just going back, piggybacking off the previous question, because we live in this era of, of brand management and publicists and spokespersons. So in the 21st century today, you're not going to see somebody like that who even in these clips that we saw, like, you know, he was speaking about his own flaws and the mistakes that he made in his life. And that in and of itself, like that brought him closer to the people. He never purported to be this perfect activist, this perfect human being, even a perfect Muslim. He was just trying to do the best that he could. And so just having somebody who's that real, who is speaking from the heart is it was a rare thing during that time frame. Obviously, like that wasn't a very he was the seminal person in that era. But in the 21st century, you don't you don't really see that. I think you are seeing like more of a willingness taking place, like especially in places like the NBA and the WNBA, where there is, and you know, the great work that jo Joshua and others are, are doing to really push this forward. But I think there was this sort of fear that existed in this age of the corporatization of, of athletics and entertainment, um, where people feel like they're going to lose, you know, endorsements or their contracts and for, rightfully so. I mean, you saw what's happened to Mahmoud Abdul Raouf and, and uh, Colin Kaepernick, you know, 25 years later. So there's constantly that 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 problem that exists. But I think people still have a duty when they have a platform to speak up. I mean, it, we're living in a time when, you know, injustice is is right there before our eyes and and people with platforms really have an opportunity to change public perception um, if they if they just use that platform to do so. So it's it's tougher. It's uh, more easy said than done, but you know, just finding folks who are willing to to speak up and use those platforms is going to be extremely important. A question for you, Mike. Um, I remember this very well, and I'm sure you do too. There was a draft in the '60s where you had to go into service. If there were a draft today, what would you say about the potential conflict between faith and patriotism to young people who would seek your counsel? You know what, I would reflect back to just what it is we're talking about with Muhammad Ali. And I said it earlier, you know, know what you believe, know why you believe it, uh, do your homework on it, and then take a stand. Uh, and, and that's what I would tell them. You know, you follow your beliefs and, and, and you stand by it and don't waver. Um, you know, the, the, and, and the one thing that Muhammad Ali made it clear and what he did was he gave today's athlete their voice. You know, uh, Megan Rapinoe, it's okay to speak for what is right and do and stand up for the gay community. It's okay to stand up for what you believe in. He was the one that gave that initial voice and let all athletes know you have a voice and you need to speak your voice. You know, LeBron James, he's letting, he's letting his actions speak loud and clear, opening up a school. Uh, and, and, I, and I think one of the biggest differences we have nowadays on a positive side is you have some of the people like the, uh, uh, what they call what is it, 3%, the Mark Cubans of the world, the, uh, the, the, I mean, even the Steve Ballmers, they're getting on board too and supporting them. And that's, that's what people like Muhammad Ali didn't have. He didn't have, you know, corporate America 
backing him. And, uh, and I think that's why we're making the progress that we're making nowadays. Um, a question uh, semi-related to this, uh, of what we saw in the Olympics and what we've seen in other uh, sports about issues of mental health. Suzanne, I wanted you to uh, address this question about how do we help advocate for uh, mental health awareness and counseling through athletes who are becoming increasingly outspoken about a, a serious problem that crosses all the spectrums. You know, this uh, athlete mental health has become one of the number one causes that our athletes come talk to us about. They want to get involved in social justice issues. They want to get involved in whatever their topics are, but mental health has become the number one thing this year. And it's important to see Simone Biles, Kevin Love, um, Naomi Osaka, um, Michael Phelps, you know, talking about this, especially as men, especially women of color, normalizing and reducing the stigma of mental, you know, illnesses. They are at the peak of their performance and they have resources afforded to them and they still struggle. And so it's about normalizing the stigma for the one in four Americans who are struggling with mental health issues. It's about bringing it up again, using their platform for good and promoting the fact that everyone struggles and athletes are just like you and I, they may be at the peak of their fitness, right? they may be at the top of their game, but they still struggle tremendously with the pressure that they're under. And so normalizing that for someone else in the world may inspire someone else to take action and seek resources that they need. Uh, Joshua, this might be uh, something you could address. Um, are there any other athletes that um, that you've encountered in your experience who have felt they want to do something but are just either intimidated, afraid, or uncomfortable with the public spotlight, even though they have something worthwhile to say, it's really hard to get through. Yes, um, I have, right? I mean, even when I was when I was playing, right, I've encountered situations just myself, right? When Colin Kaepernick was kneeling, right, to kneel or not kneel was was an issue inside of the locker room to be able to discuss, right? And and why should we, why shouldn't we, or things of that nature, right? I think there's been multiple athletes that have things to say, just don't maybe know how to articulate it. They don't know how to maybe express what they're trying to say. And, you know, to talk a little bit about some of the uh, conversations that we were having a little bit earlier, you know, some athletes have to be portrayed as the perfect human. And we all know we're not all perfect. And that's, that's sometimes an issue, right? One mistake in 2013 can now lead to a mistake that you didn't even realize was one in 2021. And for an athlete now to be able to speak up at times, you know, they have to assess all the damage that they may do by saying something and that shouldn't negate them from saying anything it just should be feeling comfortable to be able to speak up about what you feel what you think is important what your religion may be what your feeling of your faith and how you portray that right there's no there's no one way to do it i think there's just a comfort level of being able to express yourself in something that you believe in uh, kind of a round robin for each of you, and we're going to wrap up after this. Um, what athlete activists are you following right now and why? Who are you paying attention to? Who should a casual sports fan be alert to that they may not have knowledge of? Uh, we'll start with Mike. Uh, you know, I touched on it earlier. Uh, the, the guy that comes to mind for me is LeBron James. Uh, I mean, he is taking a stand and he's letting his voice be known and, uh, you know, negative things have came, come out about him. Uh, but his approach to it is, you know, I know I know what I stand for. I know what I'm all about. I know where I came from. And more importantly, I know where I'm going with all of this. And, you know, it's uh, I, I really like the stance. I mean, he, he took some stance. Uh, uh, during the during the presidential election that you know that a lot of people thought could have uh, you know kind of ruined him uh, but you know he didn't care uh, because he um, uh, I, I just just 
I, I just look at and admire that young man from the knowing where he came from in the slums of Cleveland to where he's at now and uh, how he's been such a strong and positive voice for the younger athletes who are coming up behind him in the NBA. Uh, he's a mentor to all those guys. You know, not, I'm not just talking about high school players and college. I'm talking about guys who are in the league right now. Uh, he won't hesitate to pull them to the side and make sure they're doing the things that they need need to do to make this place a better, uh, this world a better place. And I appreciate that. Imran, same question. Yeah, LeBron is the one that comes to the top of, I think, everyone's mind right now just because of the massive size of his platform and just the excellence that he's uh, he's uh, been able to achieve both on and off the court. So that's that's one. But Jalen Brown, another one in the NBA who's who's really utilizing his voice uh, to stand up. And, you know, he's a cerebral player on and off the court and really thoughtful in how he uh, approaches issues. So somebody I'm excited to see what comes in, in the upcoming years. Uh, and uh, Joshua? For me, I honestly think the WNBA, I think they've been very huge and very big about what stance they're taking on on social justice good, issues, good, good on point, issues point. in general, right? I mean, they were one of the first few teams to start wearing, you know, Black Lives Matter, right? Breonna Taylor, they were one of the first few that said we're going to boycott games along with the NBA and things like that. So for me, I, I felt like the WNBA was huge. You know, the Atlanta dream themselves, you know, with Renee Montgomery heading in front of it, you know, and, and pressuring the owner of Kelly Loeffler right out of their ownership because that was huge, right? Women empowered by that, that's, you don't see that every every lifetime. And I thought that was huge to be able to recognize that, you know, just because our owner isn't voicing what we believe, that doesn't mean that they have to own our team. They don't own us. And I felt that was huge from the WNBA to be supportive of all, all the women that have been able to speak out, speak up and uplift each other. A watershed moment, you're right. Suzanne? You have the floor for the final. Easy for me, yes. So Laysia Clarendon is one of my favorites with the WNBA. As an advocate for LGBTQ athletes, as a trans athlete coming out and being so vocal about support of female athletes in the WNBA. And then I think, honestly, the entire um, NWSL, right? Looking at Megan Rapino and what they've done around pay equality, gender equality, and just raising the issue as a collective um, I think is remarkable. And so I encourage people to get out there, go see Seattle rain, you know, go see a storm game, support your lady sports because equality and um, gender equality is equally important. So I am inspired by their advocacy. Well, great. Thank you. That is all the time we have this e evening. Suzanne, Joshua, Mike, Imran, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your insight. And thank you to our local community partners and collaborators listed below. Make sure to check out all the links to learn more about how you can get involved in their work. A special thank you to the KCTS9 members and supporters who make possible events like this and films such as Muhammad Ali. Please take a few moments to give us some feedback on tonight's event by filling out the survey linked in the chat. Enjoy the rest of your evening and be sure to watch Muhammad Ali online at kcts9.org or on your TV with Passport. Good evening.